I'm going to come down to your level because um, I don't like looking down at you. Anyway, and I need to be prompted by my slides because I have more material than I could possibly ever memorize um, to talk to you about over the next hour. But um, I'd rather just talk to you, and then I'd like to have all of us talk with you um, about some of the lessons that we've learned about how to get the WHO surgical checklist or some variant of it in place in your hospitals, in your operating rooms for the benefit of the patient. And I think it's really important. I think we heard that over and over again this morning about why we're doing this, all this stuff. And that is because of the patients that we take care of every single day. So let's see if I can get this to go. So these are the things I want to talk to you about this afternoon. I want to talk to you about Safe Surgery 2015, South Car Carolina, and what that actually means. I want to uh, talk to you about ways to think about introducing the checklist, about monitoring the checklist in your hospital, and I'll show you some tools for that. Um, I want to tell you about a call series that we're going to put, that we've already put together, but that we'll present um, beginning in the middle of um, April. I want to talk to you about how you can help, and uh, then I want to talk to you about what you can do when you go back to your um, hospitals. Can you take me to the next one now over there? All right, so there's an interesting, um, an interesting uh, jump here in time between the two projects, and I'll tell you why that is. Safe Surgery 2015 South Carolina is a part of a much bigger project whose goal it is to, is to put the Safe Surgery Checklist, like Dr. Guande said this morning, in every U.S. hospital by the end of 2015. But you guys don't have that much time. You are leaders here, and we want to learn from what happens here in South Carolina to help build the program that then can be taken to other states. So it, it's really Safe Surgery South Carolina 2013, not 2015. So we're going to give ourselves a full two years to be able to, to do this, because we realize it's a lot of work. And some of you will move very, very quickly through it, and others, it'll, it's going to take it's going to take longer. We want to learn from everybody. And then the idea is to get a modified version of the WHO checklist, a checklist, a South Carolina checklist, into every hospital for every patient for every operation. Whoop. Goes from not moving to moving too fast. All right, so I wanted to take a little bit, or give you a little bit of a quiz to get a feeling for how much work um, has been done. We know um, from the Hospital Association, anyway, that when IHI, um, when Don Berwick challenged the United States to do what we would call at the time the sprint, that 80% of South Carolina hospitals said that somebody tried the checklist in their hospital at least one time. How many of you are aware of the background of the checklist itself, more deeply than what Dr. Gwande walked through today? Checklist manifesto readers, anybody out there? Okay, I'm not gonna do a whole lot of background, but there'll be the opportunity to get into the background much more deeply um, in the months that we have in front of us. How many of you are using a modified version right now, today? Okay. Good. And how many of you have tried using the checklist at your hospital, but it kind of fizzled out? Is there anybody like that? Yeah, okay. The checklist that people are doing goes beyond the Joint Commission's well-designed well universal protocol timeout? Yes, for most people? Are people introducing themselves in your operating room? Is that a, a problem? Did the surgeon say anything aside the, from this is stupid? <laughs> so some of the surgeons are actually doing it. That's actually encouraging. That's great. All right. Well, one of the things I want to tell you is that we already have been in letter contact and by email with the CEOs across the state. Now, when we send those things out, we don't know where they end up, and my guess is that the CEO a lot of times doesn't take ownership of the letter, but we did ask for some things to happen in the hospitals. 
So the first thing we wanted was for the CEO to engage the executive leadership of the hospital and to talk to the hospital board and the medical executive committee about this effort. And we hope between that letter and what we're doing today that the message will get back to the CEOs who have formally committed their hospitals to carrying this whole project out. We asked them to meet with clinical leadership to ensure that they were committed to working on the project. And we asked them to make sure that individuals were identified that could serve as a checklist implementation team. Now, one of the things that we don't know is how much of that actually happened, or if any of it happened, anywhere. But we thought that these were all important things to lay the groundwork for the work that we want to help everybody through over the next couple of months. This is a WHO checklist, and Dr. Gwande already showed you this um, and told you a little bit about where it came from. It's roots in aviation, the fact that it's really three checklists knitted together um, in one. And I helped him at the beginning of this project, at the very, very beginning, back in 2006, before we even knew that it was going to be a checklist, with some of the ideas that are embedded up here. And I think he, he calls the process items the dumb checks, and I, I don't know whether they're dumb or they're smart, but it, this checklist really has two different kinds of things on it. One are simple process checks, and that, in ca that kind of captures all of the joint commission standards, right side, right patient, right procedure kind of things, and it also captures things in the United States like the skip measures. So this is why pulse oximetry is up there. It's all kind of processy things, and if we had two hours to talk, I could tell you where every single one came from and why it might or might not be important to you. We'll, we can deal with all that at, at another time. But the other thing that's really, really important about this checklist, and he really pushed it to you, is the fact that it is designed to be, I call it poor man's team training. It's designed to help improve communication in the operating room by trying to stimulate a little conversation at the beginning of every single case. If it's as simple as this is a regular lap coli, I don't think there are any problems and this patient doesn't really need anything special, all the way up to this patient's going to have a lot of adhesions, it's going to take me hours to get in, I'm going to have another general surgeon help me do this and we're going to need X, Y, and Z in order to accomplish what it is that we have to do. But it has both pieces. And we encourage everybody to keep both pieces because we think both pieces are important. But I will tell you another thing, and that is that the impact this checklist has, and Dr. Guante didn't touch on it very much, but it's different in different places. In the developing world, the dumb checks are very, very important. And if you think about the United States, in the mid-1990s, there were no skip measures. There was no Joint Commission Universal Protocol. So while they may be dumb to us now, they're not dumb at all to the rest of the world. There's a lot of catch up that still needs to be done. And the teamwork stuff can have tremendous impact in our own country, and I'm not so sure how ready they are for that in a lot of the rest of the world. So when you look at the results of this, they actually pretty much reflect that, and I think it explains why the thing works no matter where you use it. It's got something in it for everybody. Now, we partnered with IHI before the sprint and took the WHO checklist and modified it with them to capture the special needs of the United States of America. It has skip measures that are embedded in it, so it's been altered some. Um, and, when, and there was a document that actually goes along with this that, that helps people decide how to modify it. And there are things that we think can be modified on and things that we think can be modified off, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But this checklist is not that checklist, okay? This one's special for the United States. Now, when Dr. Gawande and Rick Foster and the Hospital Association decided to take this on and work together, one of the things that everybody recognized is this is a special place, too. The South Carolina, is, South Carolina isn't IHI, it's certainly not the WHO, it's a different place yet. And there's a special checklist for South Carolina now. And Dr. Gwande pointed out at the bottom of the middle column 
what I call a, a surgical safety statement, which is basically an invitation given by the surgeon that hopefully opens the room to more free communication by saying, and, and I'll go through a whole bunch of different ways to say this later, I have another slide about it, but it basically says if you see something that's not right here, please don't stand there in silence. Please say something. Anyway, this is South Carolina's version. You'll also notice one of the things that's different, halfway down the middle column, there's a new word, and halfway down the last column, there's a new word too. People across the country actually have asked for this, and this was an opportunity for us to begin to use those words as part of this checklist briefing and debriefing. And there are a lot of people who criticize the WHO checklist for not specifically addressing those two things, when actually built into it were those con com concepts, they just weren't spelled out. So now on the South Carolina checklist, there's a briefing section and there's a debriefing section clearly identified. So now I want to shift gears a little bit and walk you through some of the things that we think are important in bringing the checklist to your hospital. And I'm going to take you through step by step, not going really deep in detail. And, and like I said, we have a series of phone calls set up to help walk, help walk people through this whole thing in a relatively organized fashion. So the first thing that we think is really, really important, and again, a tool touched on this, is to put a team together and the team has to be a team. And by that I mean it can't all be surgeons. The team needs to have a surgeon or surgeons on it, but it also needs representatives from nursing. And in many places when they do this, they have both technicians and registered nurses on the nursing team. It needs somebody from administration who, like Atul said, can move the roadblocks if there are any. Someone from anesthesia. And if you work in a hospital that has CRNAs, as well as anesthesiologists, that both are represented. And then, of course, it needs a surgeon, because it's a surgical checklist, and they need to take a part in it. Finding clinical champions. Actually, let me touch on one more thing when I talk about an implementation team. And that is, why do this? And the reason for doing it, well, there's a whole bunch of reasons. One. You want to take that South Carolina checklist, and I'm going to talk about modification in just a little bit, but you want to make it your hospitals. And in order to do that, it needs people from your hospital giving input into what will work, what won't work, that matches our flow, that won't work in our operating rooms. There's all kinds of subtleties, and I can't tell you what those are. So you need your own team. But the next thing that's really important is when they're done with it, you need to be able to feel like it's your checklist. And the people that work in your hospital need to feel like it's your checklist. They don't need to think that it's a Tool Gawande's checklist. Please don't walk away from here thinking that. Because a tool helped, absolutely no question. A lot of brilliant ideas, but you and the hospital and the surgical team need to own the checklist. We don't need to own it. So customization and those kind of things Establishing this team, incredibly important in the work you're going to do. Finding a clinical champion. Now, my number one rule here is the nurses know, okay? Just like the nurses know, if anybody out there doesn't already know this, this is a little secret for you. If you ever get sick and you need to have surgery and you want to know who to have do your operation, I can tell you who to ask and it's not one of the surgeons, okay? <laughs> The nurses in the operating room know who's fast, who's slow, who makes mistakes, who gets in trouble, who doesn't get in trouble, who asks for help when they get in trouble, because they see it all. Now, I don't know what they say amongst themselves. I'm not a nurse, and I'm not welcome into that particular community in those conversations, but my guess is that there's a ton of knowledge that lives amongst the nurses in every single operating room. So if you want to find out, and here's the question you want to ask, what surgeon will do this and help me do it? Okay, so you're building your team and you want to know, should it be the chief of surgery or not? Well, in a lot of places, that might not be the best person to run this kind of an effort. And generally, 
the nurses will know. Pick those who are respected and who will be supportive of the effort. Never, and I'll touch on this again, never try and fix a broken surgeon by bringing them in this kind of effort. It's a total <laughs> mistake. It's like never test on somebody who you think is going to blow it up in your face. Don't go there. Start with the people who want to do it. Find the ones that want to be with you. Don't die on what Don Berwick calls the hill of resistance, because you will. Okay? And then support of formal leadership, absolutely necessary. So you want people that sit in, in the administrative positions on the medical staff, the department chiefs, and those kind of th people to absolutely support, because they can do you in if they're not behind you, but they're not always the best ones to be on your testing team and to actually help the process move along. So formal leadership and kind of what I think is informal leadership don't always line up 100%. And what you want, and I don't want to seem sexist, but you want the cool guy or the cool gal, I guess, on the surgical staff, if you can get them to lead this effort. The one that people look up to, even though they may not have that formal appointed position. Sometimes it's a, it's a relatively um, young surgeon, actually, in the first few years of their practice, very enthusiastic, and people look to them for, um, you know, for guidance and for leadership, even though they're not formal leaders. Start small, make mistakes small. Burn that into your brain. And this rule works. This is IHI's rapid cycle improvement model, PDSA. I mean, you can put all kinds of initials around it, but the basic principle is that start small and make your mistakes small. Never, ever, ever. And you heard a tool say that that initial checklist, I have this really cool little film strip, that runs through in series the first 70 revisions that the checklist went through as we tested it. When we made it the first time, we thought it was perfect, okay? Well, perfect took 70 more tries before we finally got it. And I will tell you, there still were a ton of flaws that we're continuing to fix to the present day. The biggest mistake is to make it in some little room and then say, next Tuesday, we're gonna go and roll it out across our whole OR and find out that it won't work in half of the places in your hospital for some very obvious reason that if you'd started small, you would have been able to figure out. So you only expand when you're ready. You don't give yourself a firm timeline. Now, that doesn't mean you don't hold yourself to some kind of a schedule, but be flexible, because you're gonna have to feel the culture as you go along. So when you start, you don't say, by June 1st, we're finished. You finish on June 1st if you're ready to finish on June 1st, but you stay flexible as you go through the process. You want to keep pressure on yourself to move forward, but remember, no preconceived plan ever survives its first contact with reality, okay? That has been learned by our military thousands of times, and we don't need to relearn that lesson in medicine. You think it's going to work, sounds great in a committee, then you go try and do it, and it blows up in your face. And that's not what you want to have happen with this effort, because it'll poison it further down. Preparation is everything. And I think that, you know, I liken it to painting a wall. Um, the time that you spend sanding and filling in holes and all that is terribly boring. But when you're all done, if you don't do those things, and the new paint's on the wall, every si single blemish will come through. So in order to make this turn out right, you have to make an investment in time. And sometimes it seems like a long time. But one of the things I want you to remember is, for almost all of us, doing something like this is the biggest human-based thing that you will ever do in an operating room, okay? We do a lot of things in our ORs. We change the prep. We change the antibiotic timing. But to get people to communicate better with each other, there's nothing that's ever been done before like that in an operating room, and you want it to stick. So part of the thing is that you want to take your time. You want to take the time that it takes to do it right. Modify and trial it. And when I, I started to talk a little bit about modification, it is so critically important 
If the only thing you change is to move South Carolina over and put your own hospital's name up on the top of the checklist, then that's all the modification that you need to do if nothing else needs to be changed. But by all means, make it yours in some way. Have it owned by the system or owned by your hospital because people look at that and it can still say WHO on it if you want down on the bottom. They like to get credit for the checklist that they created, so based on the WHO. But the top ought to belong to you and ought to belong to the people in the operating room. Practice using the checklist outside of the operating room <coughs> and modify it as needed. Again, I'll tell you, this is an incredible lesson because, okay, I, th I think we're pretty smart. I've been working with IHI for the last eight years as faculty for them, and I thought I knew a whole lot. And we went and we made the first version of the checklist, and like I said, we thought we were done. Until we decided to go and shoot a video. And we didn't have enough actors. I grabbed a couple of our surgical residents, and we went in to a simulated operating room, and we tried to do it, and you couldn't do it. The words were all weird, and things, and you were there trying to translate, and. And so we like, we're back to the drawing board with this. Well, this is your way around that. And that is, try it out. You know, make it in your committee, but then get a table and clean it off and have somebody lie down and pretend they're a patient and stand around the table with your candidate checklist and see if it actually works for you. Or is it still filled with weird things that just <laughs> won't work in your hospital. So test it outside of the OR. And then when you do start to test it, follow that same rule. Use it once, okay? Go in, take that very supportive surgeon, go into the operating room and use the checklist and just use it one time. And then debrief everybody at the end of that day. It's not a big rush to take it all apart right after you do it for the first time. Don't even use it in more than one case. Just use it in one that first time and see. And my guess is you'll be doing some tweaking by, by the end of that day. Maybe not, maybe it'll be perfect, but give yourself a chance to make your mistakes again in a very small way, and then you can go back in and do his whole schedule. But I'll tell you, if there's a mistake on it, and you plan to do it for the whole schedule, by the end of the day, you're just gonna have a bunch of pissed off, disconnected people in your operating room, and that's not where you wanna be. Now I said make sure to talk to everybody, and I have a little, a little story that comes from a hospital that is about three hours north of here in a neighboring state um, where they have done beautiful work. But they didn't listen to me. So they took it into the operating room, and I'm not saying you have to listen to me all the time. I'm, I'm a power freak, I was a heart surgeon for a while there, and. But um, anyway, they didn't listen to me. They went into their ORs, and they, the surgeon was the guy that led the team. The nurses on the team were very careful to talk to their nursing colleagues. They were all ready. Everybody had already seen the checklist, except for the CRNA. And he walks in that day, and he's like, what in the world is this? I am not doing that. I am safe, and I don't need it. And they had to call his supervisor, who was on the team that made the checklist, take him out in the hallway, delay the case, and explain to him, ask him please, would he help? So he said yes. And then he went back in the operating room. All that was avoidable by just a teeny little bit of pre-planning. The interesting piece of it is that he ended up a convert at the end of the day. And he ended up a convert because in the discussion of blood loss, he learned that the blood refrigerator was about 40 feet away from the operating room. And he thought that it was across the street. Okay, they have two campuses. He didn't even know they kept blood in the OR in his own hospital. So, yeah, so he would always try and like plan miles ahead if he ever thought he was ordering blood he didn't need because he wanted it in the room when it could have been sitting out in a refrigerator. So he ended up being a convert. And there's another piece of that story I'll tell you in just a minute. Debrief and modify as necessary. Use it for a whole day. And then 
start to think about how you're going to take it to the next stage. So, modification. <coughs> One size definitely doesn't fit all. We've, that, we've touched on that several times um, during the day today as, we, as we've talked about different kinds of interventions. In healthcare, you can use the modification as a way to get buy-in from people. Ownership is really, really important. And the test that you ought to use for the ones that a tool calls dumb is how good you are at it. And I don't just mean what the skip measures say <coughs> in the corporate office. I mean how really good you are at it. So when in doubt, leave it in, right? I know every, every hospital in the country has now 100% compliance with giving antibiotics on time. And yet I also know from stories that people tell me that the, that the checklist catches the antibiotics that weren't given before the incision. Well, those two are impossible. So what do I know? I know for the skip measure, the documentation is killer. But the administration of antibiotics is probably also killer and not so good. Um, so that, think about it. But if there's something you're absolutely sure, like anesthesiologists, and I respect my anesthesia colleagues tremendously, they won't do a case without a pulse oximeter, without a functioning one. That's wasted ink on most American checklists. And you could have that same discussion about whether or not you should remind the anesthesiologist to do an anesthesia machine safety check. That's like second nature to anesthesiologists. They never don't do that. But that's a discussion you can have in your own hospital. And those are the kind of things you can think about taking away. The two things not to take off, I would beg you please, don't take off the introductions. At least the first one for the morning. If a crew's gonna work together all day long, don't pull it off. It makes people uncomfortable in the beginning, but it works. And it's not just there because people don't know each other, although I will tell you, it's an absolute fact that everybody knows the surgeon, and the surgeon does not know everybody who's in the room. That's just the reality of it. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they're really good with names. My colleague heart surgeons operate with the same crews every single day. They're like their brothers and sisters on the OR team. But there's another reason why it was there. It was put there to give people a chance to have a voice. Everybody in the operating room. And there's some people you won't get around to again. So even with a little briefing, it's nurse, <coughs> surgeon, anesthetist or anesthesiologist to participate. That's pretty cool. And that participate in that, um, in that conversation, right? But if there's a surgical tech in the room, they may be part of it, they may not be part of it. If there's a medical student standing there, they may be part of it, they may not be. I remember doing cases where there'd be somebody standing over in the corner of the room, I had no clue who they were. They could have been somebody dressed up in green who'd walked in off the street, right? That's possible. It doesn't happen very often, but certainly it's a possibility. The introductions, I would ask you not, not to take off the introductions, at least on the first case, and then whenever staff changes. Somebody ought to say that the staff is changing out. That's a big complaint from, uh, from the surgeons, by the way. And then the stuff that's in the briefing and the debriefing. And here is the big temptation. Somebody said it actually, tore, it, maybe it was at lunchtime, it said that quality improvement over the last 10 years in American hospitals has been born on the back of the nurses, okay? The nurses cannot carry this, right? They're team members, and they need to be part of something that was built for a team, not for just the nurses to do. So turning it into what I call a tick box exercise defeats the entire purpose, well not the entire purpose, but nearly the entire purpose of doing it. That little conversation that you have, that's where the magic is buried in American hospitals. Having the surgeons say what they're going to do, and whether there's going to be blood loss or not, whatever is important for the surgeon to convey, having that opportunity, and then having the anesthesiologist and the nurse allowed to have input. That's what a tool called the dealing with the unexpected. And I'll tell you, because, because part of my life I work in a malpractice carrier, 
Most of the malpractice that happens in surgery is because a surgeon cuts something, ties something off, has some kind of a technical mishap in the operating room. And that's what kicks off the suit. But I'll tell you that a lot of those suits wouldn't happen if the error was responded to right. And what happens a lot in malpractice is that that initial error then triggers a chain of events, oftentimes because, 70% of the time, because of miscommunications downstream that turn a little error, which can be recovered, into a disaster that can't be recovered from. And that little communication piece is what I think makes a huge difference. And I would ask you not to take it off, even though I know the easy way out is to not ask the surgeon to do anything. Avoid adding too many items. You want the thing to stay on a single sheet of paper, if it's at all possible. And only put things on there that you don't have good safety checks for otherwise. So if there's stuff, like I said, if there's th things that you're very, very happy with your current process, stay with them. That's fine. But if there's something that you really think needs to be on there, something you're having trouble with, that you know you're having trouble with in an operating room, then you ought to think about seriously putting it on. But the ink and time are precious. You want each section to be brief. And you'd like even the middle section with the conversation to be as brief as it possibly can be to get the information that needs to be transferred, transferred. And even though the whole checklist itself in pieces is going to take more than a minute, each section you should shoot for 60 seconds for a routine case. That's not a whole lot to ask. And for, say, a routine lap coli, the surgeon's conversation can be 15 seconds long or even less to walk through that part of the checklist. So that's a reasonable goal, if you can do it. And the other is, if you really <laughs> want to turn off, especially an ENT doctor who does a lot of tubes, make the checklist longer than the operation itself. Now, a lot of times, I know my anesthesia colleagues fight with this all the time, because it actually does take longer to prepare for and do the anesthetic than it does for the surgeon to, but the surgeon probably gets paid more than you do anyway. Um, to put the little tubes in, but as a general principle, you would like not to have the situation be that the checklist makes your case twice as long as it would be otherwise. So, we have two goals here. One is to improve processes in the operating room, and I touched on that. And then the other big one is to improve communication and teamwork. And if we're going to have our two goals, then we got to keep the parts of it that get the two goals satisfied that we want to get satisfied. So, in the green boxes with the big, I'm colorblind, is it a purple arrow? Blue. Blue, okay, big blue arrow that says don't modify, don't take those things out. Don't take the briefing out and don't take the debriefing out. Because for us in American operating rooms, that's where the heart is for this. It's dealing with the unexpected. It's preparing for the handoff that we know we're not always so good at. And this is a chance to make it a little bit better. Now this is kind of cool. Watch things, oh, oh. press the button too hard. Watch things move around. Just to show you one of the ways you can modify. Suppose that you're in a hospital where the surgeon is always there at the beginning of the case. And there really are hospitals like that. This checklist isn't built for that. This checklist is built for the time when the first time the surgeon is actively involved in the surgery is at the timeout time, okay? So all the surgeon's stuff is stacked down there under a briefing. Now watch, boom. Now the introductions move to the top of the first column and the briefing stuff goes to the bottom of the first column. And to be honest, this was the way the first WHO checklist actually looked, okay? And it looked this way for a reason. The more time that the nursing staff has to respond to the needs of the surgeon, the more likely it is that they're going to be ready when the knife goes down. But we ended up with this because of the reality that in a lot of places, the surgeon's not there until the timeout actually takes place. But if your hospital is different, you should feel free. Move it. Move it sideways if this meets the needs. 
And there's the South Carolina template. All right. So I wanted to give you a couple of examples of the way that people modify. So everything up here is something that we've seen in terms of words that have been used to modify different checklist items. So here it is, everyone please state your name and role. So that's the little introduction part, right? So will everyone please state their name and role all the way down to, we'll start by introducing ourselves and roles. And I'll show you a little video clip about that shows that happening. Confirm all team members have been introduced and actively participate. So there's all kinds of words that you can use that you may be more comfortable with in your hospitals. And we'll have examples of stuff like this for you when we walk through the call series. All right, and then we can move down to that surgical safety statement. Well, it turns out people have taken a lot of different approaches to saying those words. On the template it says, does anybody have any concerns? If you see something that concerns you during this case, please speak up. But you could say, remember that all are free to voice any concerns at any time throughout the procedure. Or does anyone have any concerns? If you think there's a problem, please speak up. There's all kinds of different ways to say that. And your hospital, matching your culture, may settle on a way that seems the most natural to the way that you do your work. But the idea is keep the spirit. Change the words if you feel like you need to or it's important in your institution. But keep the spirit. The idea is try and invite people to say something. Now I can tell you the exact wrong way to do it, which I heard at one of our Boston hospitals. And that was when the surgeon first saw the checklist and he first saw this statement, his interpretation was, that the statement should be, speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> That's why I'm giving you a briefing. Speak now or forever hold your peace. And it's like, no, we're not getting married. That's not what this is all about. This is about having people say something if they see something they're concerned about, that we want everybody to feel like they can say something. These are three, four questions that you can ask yourself when you're all done and you're putting it in your operating room Am I doing the checklist or not, okay? So let's see if you can answer all these questions in the affirmative. Does the entire team stop all activity at the three critical points in the case? Do you guys all think that that happens every time? Are people fiddling in the corners and counting sponges and, okay, we know the Joint Commission doesn't like that. They get upset if they see you doing that in your operating rooms, but we don't want you to do it either for the sake of this. So they ought to be hard stops and if it's not at a point where people can stop, then you ought to move the hard stop a little bit so you can have a hard stop. Does the team verbally confirm each item on the checklist? Okay, operative word there is what? Verbal, right? <laughs> Saying something with words as opposed to ticking the little box in silence. Too many times we walk into operating rooms and see the circulating nurse sitting there proudly with her institution's checklist and a pencil, ticking off, oh, we have that, we have that, we have that, we have that, and that's not what this is all about, if that's the only thing that you take away from what I'm saying. Are the items verified without reliance on memory? This is another thing that happens. I've seen Dr. Gwande do this once or twice when they didn't have the poster in the room. There's a poster in his room now where he can read it off the wall, but before that, he tried to memorize the checklist. Memorize it. Is that what you want your pilot to do? Memorize the checklist? What if he forgets to put the flaps down? I want him to read the checklist, right? And check the little boxes as they walk through it. That's what you're after. Um, so verbal, and are they reading it off of something? And then does your checklist promote teamwork in some way? So have you not stripped out the conversations? But that's still sitting in there so people can have that conversation at the beginning of the operation. This is not a quality improvement effort that can be meaningfully accomplished by the nursing staff alone. And unlike many other quality improvement efforts in our hospitals that the nurses have done a yeoman's job at affecting, this one will not work on their backs all by themselves. Avoid the temptation to take the easy way out, and that's to pull out anything that has to do with a surgeon. A checklist that becomes a tick box exercise is not a checklist at all. 
and don't count on your IT system to bail you out. A tool didn't have that slide up for very long, and I don't know how many of you caught it, but it showed, documented, people filling the checklist out two hours before the operation, and up to two hours after the surgery was done. And that's because it's IT embedded. Everybody looks at the flashy plasma screens that this company sells, and oh, this is the solution, this is the future. Well, it may be the future, but it doesn't assure that you're doing what you're supposed to do. And that's what verbal does, that's what reading it does, that's why we encourage people to put it on the wall, if possible, for people to read. All right, as you do your rollout, educate, educate, educate. You cannot educate too much. And there's two approaches that you can take with that. One is to try and talk to people in a big group, and that's probably a good way to do it, grand rounds kind of a format. But also to talk to everybody separately. And there are two levels of separately. One I'm gonna talk about a little bit more. One level of separately is to talk at section meetings if you have those kind of things. So for the surgeons anyway, to talk at the cardiac surgeons meeting, to talk at the urologist meeting, whatever, because it gets a little bit closer to the people who are actually gonna do it. But the other is to talk and engage every surgeon um, as an independent actor. Everybody gets personal contact. So this is one of the things that we think is important now. We have watched in a handful of hospitals People implement this way. And the big complaint that usually comes back is, we got a lot of surgeon resistance. We brought it into the operating room and the surgeons just didn't want to have anything to do with it. And I have another slide I didn't bring because this isn't predominantly a surgical audience. But I remember how I felt at the very beginning of the testing of the whole idea of the timeout. And my whole gig was, I'm already safe. I don't need this. A tool needs it. He kind of needs a little help. But I don't need any help because I'm already the safest surgeon in this whole hospital. And we know that if you don't engage people, that that's the feeling that they get. And it's a feeling. It's not always based on logic. And I don't care how many New England Journal papers I stack in front of you. They will pick them apart. We go after the p-values and the cluster randomization or whatever it was that we did or we didn't do in the experimental design. But it's how they feel about it that really matters. So this is what we think is important. Talk to people. Talk peer to peer. Talk nurse to physician. One of the questions you need to ask is do you have a good enough relationship to have that kind of a discussion? But a lot of operating room nurses do have that kind of relationship with the physicians that they work with every single day. And notice that everybody includes everybody. And one of the things that we're gonna do, which we have for you in the future, is a script that you can actually use to guide that discussion when you talk to a surgeon. That tries to actually touch on that. To try and prepare yourself for the answers that you always get, which is I'm already safe and I don't need this, okay? And your comeback to that, what's a reasonable comeback to that? You're right, you don't need it. But is there anybody else on the hospital staff who does? Would this make our hospital safer? And if the answer to that is yes, then you ask for their help. But I guarantee you, if you ask for your help and you're standing up here where I am, that's not gonna be very effective. But if you're sitting three feet away from them and you're the only two people in the room, the power rises significantly that they'll make a commitment to you to at least give it a try, which is what you're after. You want to at least not oppose you violently. And we've actually worked with other hospitals where that, where that was the advice that we gave the nursing staff and it actually worked. They went and they talked to the surgeon and they said, please, at least don't oppose us. I know you don't want to do it but let us put it everywhere in the operating room. And then the guy ends up doing it in the end. So it can be a long trip around, but just a different way of thinking about it. Make a video, and I told you about the little thing where we made the video and we learned a tremendous amount. There's all kinds of videos, and actually the video coming up, probably, yeah. I think. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple videos that have been done in other places. Um, one is kind of a, a good example of a how-to video, and then I'm also going to show you a kind of laughable how not to do the checklist video. 
We learned so much when we shot this in the simulator about how to do it. I think one of the things we also learned was it was a way to help people who actually get more engaged in the whole project and everything. But I encourage you to make a video. What I would not encourage you to do is shoot live over patients. Now I know your, your, your you know, blanket consents and stuff may say it's fine to do that, but if you're gonna do this, please, at least do it in an empty OR with a fake patient the first couple of times that you run through it. The power of a local video cannot be understated. And this has worked not only in the United States, but also in our work overseas. As we tried to do this in all those places that, he, that Atul talked about, we tried to get them to shoot their own videos, and it makes a difference with their own accents, with their own language, to shoot that way, then this is the way that it looks in Boston. Ah, the video. Can you make it go? This is a hospital in Denver. One of the most enthusiastic um, head OR nurses I have ever met in my life. Hi, welcome to Exemplus St. Joseph Hospital in Denver, where we've taken the World Health Organization checklist and adapted it for our timeout process. We incorporate Joint Commission regulations and patient safety. Time out. Gotta take a little time. Hi there. Hi. Oh, before we go back to the OR, I just want to double check a few things. Okay. First, I want to make sure I've got the right patient. So, can I check your name down? And can you state your name for me? Amanda Smith. And Amanda, when's your date of birth? 12 181. That's correct. Okay. What are we doing for you today? You're going to fix a disc in my neck. Okay. Do you know which levels? Five and six. Okay. Uh, do you have any allergies? Penicillin. Okay. I want to last time you ate or drink anything. About 11 o'clock last night. Okay. And the only thing you have to do is just put a mark on your neck. Okay. I'd rather not be marked. That's okay. Okay. We can just use this wristband, but uh, it says anterior cervical discectomy infusion C56. Okay. Perfect. I'll just put that on. There we go. Perfect. Okay, let's head back to the OR. Yeah. All right. Okay, let's do the timeout. Amanda, we're going to go through the room and introduce ourselves. My name is Brenna, and I'm going to be the circulator in the operating room with you. I'm Dr. Lee. I met you in Korea. I'm the anesthesiologist. I'm Dr. Watts, your surgeon. You know me? I'm Michelle. I'm your scrub tech for the day. So for our patient, I have Amanda Smith. Okay. H number 0772770. Correct. Date of birth 121. Correct. Amanda is here today for C5, C6, anterior cervical discectomy infusion. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. Right. All right, she'll be in the supine position. Okay, her only known allergy is penicillin. Dr. Lee, Dr. Watson, are there any critical steps? Yep, very straightforward. Nope, not on my part either. Okay, um, estimated blood loss? Uh, less than 100. Okay. Uh, any patient specific concerns? She has diabetes and we'll be checking her blood sugar in the case. Okay. okay, our pulse ox is on and working. Michelle, has our sterility been confirmed? It is confirmed. Okay. Uh, any plans for irrigation? Uh, Bassie. Okay. I've added to there and sit on the table. Perfect. Um, is all of our required equipment and implants in the room? Yes, it is. Implants in Okay. Dr. Lee, antibiotics? I'm about to hang you at one gram of Okay. Uh, let's see. Does Amanda have her tent clothes on? Uh, yes. Okay. And any essential imaging you want to? Uh, essential imaging is displayed. Are we all in agreement? Yes. yes. All right. Time in. Let's go. Okay, we're done. Dr. West, can we do our closing? Absolutely. All right. How shall I record the name of the procedure? Uh, anterior cervical discectomy infusion C56. Uh, both our first and final count have been correct. Great. Uh, how should I label the specimen? Uh, yes. C56. Okay. Right, six. Were there any problems with the equipment? Not at all. Okay. And are there any concerns for the recovery of the patient? Not at all. Things are very smooth. Okay. Closing is complete. Thanks.
Now, I showed you that not to show you the way, okay? Please don't take that away. This may not be the way for your hospital. It may not, you know, there may be, this was done two years ago. It may not even be right in 2011, every single thing that's on there. It doesn't match exactly the checklist that I showed you by any means. But making something like that, and you can see, has tremendous power as a teaching tool inside of your own institutions. If you can show people something like that, that you made yourself, people recognize it's your own operating room, it means a whole lot. And it's a time when a picture really is worth a thousand words. You get to watch people go through it. Now the next, be or the next better thing would be if people could actually practice it for every OR ahead of time. That's not always practical. A tool really thinks that's the gold standard, but that's, I think a lot of times we just can't do that. But this is something that you definitely should think about doing. Now, this is um, how not to do the checklist. Um, this was shot by some of my friends. Um, is a tool in this one? A tool is in this video. He's the terrible surgeon um, that you get to, you'll get to watch. And this will kind of, it's also a fun thing to do if you want um, at your own institutions to kind of show people um, a parody of sorts of how you shouldn't behave during the timeout. Can you give me a run? Okay, uh, let's do our sign in. I've checked all the boxes, so I think we're all set. Okay, it looks like we're all set to go. Uh, can we do our team introductions? Check one, Nick. Team introductions. So, all right, I'm the surgeon. It's time to go. Okay, uh, I'm the circulator, I'm Tom, can you, no, 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 let's get going, let's get going. Can you do your timeout, please? Time. Can you do your timeout, please? Richard writes, I guess we're doing a right angle hernia repair. Um, this is totally routine, let's get going. Um, Mike? Uh, any unexpected steps for critical events? Incision? Uh, do you want uh, Do you want me to get some antibiotics? Oh. Anyone want to do the sign out? We did a left thing on the repair and the sponge counts are correct, so I guess we're all set. <laughs> that, um, that actually isn't a real nurse, it's a surgery resident who was playing a nurse on TV for us there, um, who actually was the author of a lot of those very early papers that we wrote um, about the checklist and about the problems in surgery around the world. Tom Weiser, he's a really cool guy. But you can see how you can have fun with it and you can make something that's a really good teaching tool. And if it makes people laugh, it's a way to get people engaged too. So I would encourage everybody to think about doing that kind of a thing. All right, train and use coaches. Now I'll tell you where this comes from and it's not, it, it isn't what you, this isn't a brilliant idea that came from us. Um, it came because of problems that we had at one of the pilot sites. Um, that would happen to be the one in Tanzania. And so they really struggled. One little cute story, and that is, you know, the introduction part? It ended up being a little bit of an issue there because it's their tradition whenever they introduce themselves to tell you about their entire family history back several generations. <laughs> so the introductions are taking too long, and that took a little work to get that out. But... <laughs> But we also found that we, we were having trouble getting them to do the checklist properly. And we uh, arranged to have a medical student actually go and spend six weeks at that site helping them as a coach um, to use the checklist. So that's where we learned how coaches were so important. Um, we hope, and we'll talk a little bit more about observations later, that they might be able to be the same people, that they should be trusted and respected and known by most of the people in the operating room. And that just makes sense. You don't want to put somebody as a coach in there who doesn't work in the operating room just because they want to coach. Start where it's easiest. This is another one of those rules like start small. Always start where it's easiest and you'll, um, you'll notice the bottom line there. Don't try and fix either problem staff or physicians with the checklist. That's not the right place. 
If you have people that you know are going to be an issue, try and deal with the issue outside of the operating room theater. Don't use the checklist, because they won't do it right. And they'll mess up your work in trying to get it put. Always start with the willing. And um, use the same role at the beginning and all the way through. So like if you're trying to decide how to do a staged rollout, suppose you have 16 ORs in your place. And, and, and I've told you now, don't, don't do it everywhere all at once or it'll blow up on you. For sure, if you're trying to figure out how to take it through, sit down with the OR nurses and make a list. Oh, ortho is going to be easier than urology, which is going to be easier than, than pediatric surgery. Whatever your list looks like, start at the place where you think it's going to be the easiest and gradually build support in your institution. Don't like pick out the ones that are the very hardest as the very first place because you're way more likely to fail. Collect stories. We've talked a lot about stories today with Marshall, um, with Marshall Gantz. Post stories, this is one of the things that's been done in a lot of places, is to take the stories, the catches or whatever you want to say that the checklist did good, record those on paper and put them up someplace in the operating room, in a lounge or whatever, where people can actually see that it had an effect that was positive. That's to remind me to tell you the back half of the story about the CRNA, why he was such a convert when he was all done. Well, it turned out that the surgeon really took the briefing very, very seriously. He was a vascular surgeon. They were doing an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And during his briefing, he said, I'm going to put the cross clamp above the renal arteries for this case. Now, I'm not an anesthesiologist, but I was involved with enough aortas that I know that that makes a difference. That makes a difference in how you want to manage the patients. Anesthetic, blood pressure control, whether you want to give them some kind of pretreatment, whatever, it makes a difference. And the CRNA was very grateful for having had that information shared with them at the beginning of the operation. So he was a convert. Blood, he knew where the blood refrigerator was, and he knew the case was more complex than he had thought it was um, walking in the front door. So he could do a better job. Advertise, just like you can't educate too much, you can't advertise too much. It needs to, there needs to be clear support from the highest places, like they were talking about the signs with people scrubbing their hands merrily as part of the hand washing initiative. The same thing here, and you want support from respected clinicians, for sure. So, monitoring the checklist, and we've talked a little bit about this, and we think it's really, really important. So I want to talk to you about a couple tools that we have that we want to share with everybody, and some research that we're doing that I also want to offer to people. This is an observation tool that's focused on the performance of the checklist itself. So one of the things that we think is really important is for you to know, to be able to answer that question, are they doing it? Are they stopping? Are they paying attention? Is the right information being shared? And I'll just cut a couple things out. I don't know whether you can read them from the back or not. But this blows up a couple of the things. And one of the things that that observation tool tries to rate is what's the buy-in of the people who are doing this? And it's very subjective, I realize. But it at least is a measurement. And there's a whole bunch of other questions on that. Form that give the hospital an idea how are we doing in terms of getting the checklist actually in place? Something you could use if you're already doing it as well to see how well you're doing. And this is another tool that's designed to try and get at some of the different aspects of teamwork. And I can read you off some of the things that it says. Team members share key information as it becomes available. Recipients make a visual or spoken effort to confirm that they understood when information was communicated to them. Team members call attention to potential hazards or omissions. Now, obviously, all those things aren't going to happen in every single case, but the whole tool, the whole thing itself, is actually relatively informative about how people are interacting in the operating room. So we have two things. Are you doing the checklist pretty well? And is the checklist helping you become a better team? And the whole idea is to do this a couple of times during the course of putting the checklist in or even to use it after you've already put the checklist in to see where you are or to monitor your progress. So we have two different options that, um, that we want to make available. First, the tools are available to everybody, including a little, um, 
a little set of instructional videos that help people learn how to use the tools that will be available on the web. So it, it actually shows you just, just, and there are very good examples, very similar to the videos that I showed you. A good timeout, a bad timeout. Good communication, bad communication. So one of the options is to use the tools in your own hospital and monitor your own stuff. And we would like everybody to at least do that. But there is a second option, and that is to participate in a formal research study that we have that's been exempted from IRB approval up in Boston, but you'd have to decide how you want to handle that at your own institution, where we'll analyze the data, we'll feed it back to you in a reasonable period of time, like three or four weeks, you send it to us and we'll send it back to you, which also has the, well, obviously it has the benefit of contributing to overall knowledge. What we're trying to understand better is the factors that make for a successful implementation and does using something like this really help to change the teamwork in the operating room. Two things that have not been done around the checklist itself. So, let me tell you a little bit about the call series. The first call is scheduled toward the end of, of April, and what we want to do is we have a series of calls set up, mostly for people who haven't done very much work, but we also encourage anybody, even if you have it already in place, to please be on the calls, or at least on some of the calls, because if you've done this successfully, we'd love to be able to have you share your ideas and we, you know, we'd love to know how much progress you made. But the other thing is on the call series, you might learn some things that will help you tune up what you already have in place. We, we have materials to assist with implementation. We're gonna have a discussion about measurement, um, about those tools, a deeper discussion about the tools. And we wanna follow people's progress through this. So what can you do for me? And for the project, and for a tool, and for your patients? Participate in the call series if you possibly can. Coach individuals at your own hospital. Track your hospital's use of the checklist and give us feedback. And the last thing's really, really important because we want to know how it's going down here because we want to be able to take all these learnings and use them someplace else. I will tell you that um, people from the hospital association actually are gonna start visiting some of your hospitals just to make contact with you. And we also are gonna try and visit more hospitals in South Carolina over the upcoming months to kind of see how things are going and to help people out. So you'll probably be seeing Lizzie and me and Sonny um, someday knocking on your door um, to ask you how the checklist is going in your hospital. And what do you do now? Well, the first thing you could do, I told you about the CEO thing. The first thing you could do would be to go back and see if anything ever happened. And if it did, do they need help? Um, and actually seeing that an implementation team forms, which is clearly the very first step and something that you could work on right away. Getting that small team together that's gonna do this and drive it needs to be done any place that it's gonna be done. And then, because it takes time to get on people's schedules and stuff, you might think about scheduling a big meeting for as many people as you can get together toward the 1st of July. Now, I realize that borderlines on summer and things get a little disrupted during the summertime all the time, but the way the timing works out, that's about the time that you would want to have a large meeting with your hospital staff. So those are two things that you can, um, can think about. Now the last thing is we have a website. Um, it is embryonic, but it does have content, and you are welcome to visit it. It is safesurgery2015.org. Um, .com doesn't go to it yet. But Not yet. Next week. Yeah. Um, but Safe Surgery 2015 does go to a live website that has content. There's a subsection specifically devoted to the state of South Carolina. Um, one of the things that we really want to do is be able to follow the progress of the state. So there's, you'll see there's a map. It's not on this slide. There's a map of South Carolina, actually, a much prettier one than a tool showed, that um, will let us see where people are as they tell us and they move toward implementation um, at their hospitals. So, does anybody have any questions about the stuff that I said? And then I'd love to open it up um, for a discussion. Up to the ER. 
Yeah, I think that um, common, common sense prevails. Common sense prevails. I think, I mean, I think one of the things we've heard anecdotes of, as much information as you can transfer in a short period of time, if you can do that, do it. Um, to sit there and like run down the checklist, obviously, it would border on the absurd in that kind of an emergency. But if you can broadcast some of the information rather than just thinking it in your own head, we actually have heard of a couple of anecdotes of patients whose lives were probably saved by the information that was shared right at the beginning of an emergency. Like I remember one in particular was a patient that was having a total hip replacement and they went to, I don't understand a lot about orthopedics, but they went to fix the acetabular component with a screw and the screw went through the iliac artery. So then the patient started to bleed out. And some of the things that like they immediately said, get a vascular surgeon and went through some of the things they might need to get control immediately. And the resident that scrubbed that case thought that saved the patient's life, just that information transfer. And I can, I can tell you that at the, um, at the Brigham, we had the same conversation about when, because we did a lot of urgent cases. Absolutely. And, and so we, and it was, you wanted, people wanted it written down. And what we decided to do was, we actually wrote it down. We said, unless you're actually doing CPR or ACLS, that we would do the checklist. So the standard became really far over that the checklist was going to get done unless you were really in a resuscitation mode. Um, and so it, it was like what Bill's saying. I think you, you revert to common sense, but the rule, I mean, if people wanted a rule, there it was. It was, you did the checklist every time, essentially. Um, so. Any other question from anybody? That's a lot of stuff to throw at anyway. Do the places that are doing the checklist already think that you could tune it up? Could it be better than it is right now? Yeah. We, I mean, we would, look, first, we'd love to have you to tell your stories when we have the <coughs> call series, and we'd love to help tune it up, too, to make it everything that it, that it ought to be. Um, to get the most benefit. There's a, there's a question in the back, Builder. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's interesting. And I would say, um, I would say controversial. Um, I, th I mean, if it's an emergency, then I think you want to parse your words pretty carefully. But you do need to say what needs to happen. I mean, clearly, preparation for surgery trumps what the, the patient might or might not remember. I mean, if you're talking about something like Dr. Wright was talking about, I mean, you gotta say what you gotta say. Um, where the question comes up more is like the case where they showed the neck surgery and they clearly were introducing themselves and running through part of the checklist with the patient awake, whether or not you should talk about blood loss in front of the patient, which is a great question. And I've heard it answered by actually a handful of surgeons who said if that's the first time that the patient thought that you were going to have blood available for them, you have done a miserable job of preparing your patient. Um, so you should not have a problem saying that you're ready to deal with the blood that the patient should have known that they might need um, before the operation. So I, it's two different ways of looking at it. I understand both sides. You know, people say, well, I don't want to scare, I don't want to scare the patient. And where we hear it more is overseas, actually where I think there's a lot of patients that don't ever hear that they might get blood for a case. I can tell you, have you guys had surgery with the timeout? Any of you had the experience of going into an American operating room being awake during the timeout? You did? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah, so I had an operation, and um, I'll tell you the worst part of it for me, and you can tell me if you have this share, maybe they did it differently is I felt like it was a piece of wood. They read my name and my two identifiers, and this is blah, 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 and they never talked to me. I felt safer for them having had a conversation. I can tell you that for absolute sure, but I also felt kind of bad because they didn't engage me um, in the conversation, and I thought they could have, and they didn't. I was a wood piece. They clearly, they were just doing the universal protocol. They weren't doing the checklist. 
I think the awake issue was a really big issue for a number of surgeons and anesthesiologists and nurses. And um, but I agree. I mean, it's exactly what Bill said. There's there's really nothing in that conversation that is a secret from the patient, right? Uh, so I think that it's our discomfort about doing that. And I think that we've shifted. And I think part of the problem with people countries outside of ours is that they're more paternalistic than we typically are. And so I think that there's nothing there. It's just our discomfort with having that conversation. So we have to get used to it. And that's really important. And I think the other part is that, the, especially when you're starting it, the patient is in the whole state, and the patients aren't aware that you're doing it. They may be surprised. Are you telling me this is the first time that you, know, you don't know the surgeon that I'm working with? You know, I'm in, and so I think it's really important that the patients realize that, hey, this is what we do every time. This is part of our checklist. So especially if it's new, if you don't have big posters up in your uh, pre-op area or holding area, that you got to tell them that you're going to do it. Um, and that's really important. And then you got to engage the patient. So you ask, I think the video shows it pretty well, where you ask the patient, do you agree? Is this, is this your case? Is this the? Maybe I'm wrong, but in the video, they went through the patient and timeout. Yeah. But didn't you have some protocols in the patient that you prepped the grade? Yeah, that's why the big disclaimer. Yes. OK? That is, that is what they did when they did it. And I don't know how tight the Joint Commission language was when that was filmed. So I, I, that's why I gave you the disclaimer. You don't necessarily want to copy so what they so, did. So, but I gotta tell you, like for example, where we are, half the patients are awake, right? So they've got regional anesthesia on board, we do cataracts, and so you gotta get used to doing it with the patient awake. But they're prepped great, they're awake, they're participating. I mean, they may be sedated, they may be not very sedated. Um, but you gotta, you got to let them know. As the uh, timekeeper and moderator, we'll bring the, uh, the, the uh, learning session formally to a close, and then the panel will be available. And I'll, I'll just ask each of the panelists for um, a 30-second answer um, to a question. But uh, I'll say that the, um, Dr. Gwandi uh, laid out what the opportunity was here. He said at half of the, v, the, half of the effectiveness of the VA, that would be 500 lives in South Carolina saved, $25 million at a cost of $10 per patient. Just, a, just an incredible opportunity. And that's at half of the uh, effectiveness of the VA. And, uh, but what we heard from, from this team was it's the most difficult thing you'll do in your operating room in your lifetime to be able to pull it off. So their advice is hard won. Um, and, and very important. And what I would ask for each one of you is what, are, what would you say of that list of advice that you gave? What are the top three for you, the top three for you, and the top three for you? Start small. Please, start small. Don't, don't do a big bang rollout because you'll die on a hill of resistance. Talk to everybody. Try to engage people one-on-one. -on -one. Take the time, even if it's only five or ten minutes. And don't make it on the morning that you're going to use a checklist in somebody's operating room. Talk to them. Try and talk to people ahead of time. And that really means talk to everybody that's, that's going to do it. Um, you asked for three. While well, you're things. thinking. I said modification well, of the checklist is incredibly important. Customization. Customization. Okay. You took them all. Now, so, so I agree. <laughs> I, I, th I think that, I mean, obviously, we're all kind of all on the same page on this. but. But I think that talking to everyone, and I've done it a couple times where I was personally involved with it. And for the second one, I literally went, and I personally went, it was part of my role as patient safety quality at, at the Mass Eye and Ear, and I went and talked to every single person that I could talk to. And if I didn't get to them, so I went to the surgical division section meetings, and if I didn't get to them, I had our surgical, the surgical member of the team actually personally go and talk to them. And then we hit them again, whether it was I paged them the night before, um, and said, we're going to do it in your room tomorrow. I just want you to know, do you have any questions about it? Um, that's, that's number one. Number two is, I, I don't want to sell it short, because we, we've all kind of briefly mentioned it, but the idea of the first time you do it in your OR as the surgeon, if you could take 10 minutes, delay your case for 10 minutes on that day, and practice it, that would be fantastic. So that you actually have one of the monitors, one of the team members, um, whether it's the anesthesiologist, surgeon, nurse, the administrator, whoever it might be, it's actually going to go into your room that very first time that you as a surgeon are doing it and actually run through it with you once. That's fantastic without the patient. If you can't do that because you don't want to mess up your first case on time starts, whatever it is that your culture is, if the first time the surgeon does it, if you can get in the room with them and actually see them and help them and coach them, um, 
we committed at the Brigham that we were going to watch every surgeon at least once. And we tried to do it in the very first week that they did it. So the, in the, sometime in the very first week that that was rolling out in that service, we watched every surgeon. And we kept track of it. And if we didn't uh, get them the first time, we went back around at their block time and did it. And if they did it poorly or they didn't do it well, we went back to them again um, and made sure we did it. And if we weren't able to do it, we got the surgical colleague, surgical chief, that division, you know, kept going up the rank until they did it right, did it correctly. And depending on your situation where at the Brigham where we didn't have the surgeon always there at the start. Cardiac surgery was particularly hard, right? Because they were never there at the start of the case because it was a fellow, et cetera. And we needed to get them at the start to do it. To get them to come in an hour and a half earlier into that room before they would normally do it was really a challenge. But we committed to doing it. And we got them. We called them on the phone. We said, we got to watch you do this. So I don't know if I gave you three or six or two. But, uh, <laughs>